Hey guys, what's up? Happy Friday and welcome back. Thanks so much for tuning in this week for another episode of the B Music Reviews podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Musica. As always, we're going to analyze, review, and discuss the latest news and dive into the past regarding movies, music, video games, and much, much more. If you don't already, be sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at B Muse Reviews. And tune into the B Muse Reviews podcast each week on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and all other streaming platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, we thank you so much for tuning in. Please be sure to like, subscribe, leave a comment below, and to hit the bell icon to receive notifications that informs you exactly when our podcast goes live, as well as all other video content. Also, be sure to visit our website at www.musicaprojects.com. There you will find all important links to our latest podcast episodes, new projects currently available, and also previews of those currently in development, along with our latest blog posts. If there's a question or a topic that you'd like us to discuss on the podcast, send them to bmusereviews at gmail.com with podcast question slash topic in the subject line. With all that out of the way, let's not waste any more time and get right to this week's news. Welcome everyone to the BMUs Reviews podcast. Alrighty, greetings and salutations, everybody. I am back. I am risen. I am officially risen. I do apologize for the delay in getting another episode out to you guys. I recently had surgery, um, had all four of my wisdom teeth out. So bear with me as I record this a few days post surgery. I've been itching to record this and get this out to you guys. So, but we've got plenty of great things to talk about today and don't want to waste any time. Let's get right to it. All right, in our first topic today, should movie theaters bring back intermissions? Now, rumors have been swirling for quite a bit now that movie theaters across the U.S., uh, Regal, Cinemark, AMC, you name it, across the U.S., theaters are looking at the possibility of introducing, reintroducing, I should say, uh, intermissions for film screenings that clock in around two and a half hours or more. Now, with no surprises, of course, uh, audiences and critics are deeply divided on this topic. You know, for myself personally, I have absolutely no problem with seeing a two and a half hour plus film on a regular basis. I have no problem with it. The issue that I have is if that two and a half hour to three hour movie is not good, I should say, uh, is not up to par with others. Um, you know, the length of the film, the length of the film really doesn't mean all that much, as does the title. Like, the titles of films really don't mean anything. They serve a purpose in terms of describing the story. At the end of the day, how is the script? Um, how is the production? You know, what sort of you know, what sort of talent do you have in your feature film? Overall, how does the story pace out? Does it make sense? Are there unnecessary things in the movie that you could take out? Like, stuff like that matters to me much, much more than the overall length of a movie. The only time I'll ever feel the length of a film, the only time I'm worried about the time and wondering when the movie's over is if it doesn't keep my interest. And for all those reasons I just mentioned, if it doesn't have a great script, if the talent doesn't gel, there's no chemistry on screen, if the director and producers weren't able to uh, squeeze every last drop of uh, success out of the production, then at the end of the day, those are the type of movies that I'm going to have more of an issue sitting two and a half hours or three hours through. And I would gladly welcome an intermission uh, for those films and a lot of times you would see me uh, probably not go back into the theater after the intermission but but with all that being said it's looking like these intermissions may be reintroduced overall i'm really curious to know what you all think do you believe theaters should bring back intermissions if you do 
let us know. And if you don't, let us know. Whether you agree or disagree with uh, this idea, I'm really curious to know your thoughts. Please be sure to write to us and let us know. And uh, be sure to comment below if you're watching on YouTube as well. All right, and our next topic. The live action Hercules film that is currently in development is apparently going to be inspired by TikTok. By TikTok. Yes, you heard that correctly. Will this idea go the distance? That is one of the main questions on everybody's mind when hearing this news. Now, this news comes to us from the New York Post. The producer and director, Joe Russo, recently revealed that the forthcoming live-action Hercules film will absolutely push the boundaries of cinema. Russo said, and I quote, Hercules is a little bit more experimental in tone, a little bit more experimental in execution. I think they're excited to see what we can all bring to it in a way that isn't just a reinterpretation of the animated film, end quote. The Avengers Endgame director cited the nation's obsession with TikTok as his chief source of inspiration for the remake. I quote, Audiences today have been trained by TikTok, right? What is their expectation of what the musical looks like and feels like? Russo then continued to say, I quote, That can be a lot of fun and help us push the boundaries a little bit on how you execute a modern musical. End quote. Now, the animated film version was released in, by Disney in 1997, and... It basically reimagines the story of the Greek demigod Hercules as a rising celebrity who gains notoriety thanks to his acts of um, heroism, basically. But Russo is also revealing that they're working on the new movie with Guy Ritchie, who also directed the 2019 live-action Aladdin remake. This is very, very interesting stuff. I mean, I think that people may be reading a little bit too much into his comments. That's at least my hope. <laughs> I hope that I am. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think that they're looking to... I more so look at the, what Joe Russo said in the sense that they want to be experimental. I don't necessarily think that you're going to see, you know, um, this Hercules film in you know an hour and a half version of a TikTok reel that you would see on the app. No. Not at all. I just think that the musical choices, the choreography, the shorter musical numbers, if you will, I think that is more so what Joe Russo is discussing here in terms of the experimental tone, the fresh perspective, the reimagining of the film away from the animated version that came out in 1997. Great year, by the way. Um... I think that overall, they're more so pushing the boundaries of the execution and the experimental side of this production. I don't see this being any sort of TikTok reel or anything like that. With the creativity on the app and with all the new advanced uh, features that are featured not only on, the, on that app, on TikTok specifically, but... On other apps as well, all across social media, I think that the overall landscape has changed dramatically. And instead of sticking to the old way of doing things, I really think they're going to try to take a lot of chances with this film. And for a filmmaker to you know come out and say all this, I commend them and I respect them for doing so. I'm, I'm curious to see how this film turns out. I'm rooting for their success. Of course, I do not want this to be bad or to fail in any sort of way. I'm hoping they succeed in their venture. Um, it's always exciting to hear that a fresh perspective and a reimagining, um, they're getting experimental with things. Experimental could be, you know, it's always hit or miss, obviously, because it's an experiment. It's a, you know, you're writing a hypothesis for something that you hope really goes well and that you think will, but ultimately, it's a lot of things are out of your hands. And whether this hits or not, that remains to be seen. But this this film still is in the early stages of its uh, pre-production. Not sure exactly when they're going to begin uh, filming this live-action uh, Hercules film, but should be soon enough. When when we have more news on this film, we will be sure to talk about it here on the podcast. But in the meantime, 
Really curious to know what you all think. Please be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. What do you think about the live action Hercules film currently in development being inspired by TikTok? Let us know your thoughts. All right, in our next topic today, Brendan Fraser was recently interviewed and he says that he will not attend the Golden Globe Awards even if he's nominated. This comes to us directly from Yahoo News. There is already talk of actor Brendan Fraser getting award nominations for his comeback role in The Whale, even before its December 9th premiere. But if that role gets him an invite to the 2023 Golden Globe Awards, Fraser said he's not going. The reason why? Well, he pins it on the Hollywood Foreign Press Association specifically, the organization that puts on the show. Brendan Fraser said, and I quote, I have more history with the Hollywood Foreign Press Association than I have respect for the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. No, I will not participate, end quote. He continued saying, and I quote, it's because of the history I have with them and my mother did not raise a hypocrite. You can call me a lot of things, but not that, end quote. To this day, Frazier says that the Hollywood Foreign Press Association has yet to apologize for what happened, a claim which the organization disputes and says they have done so twice. Burke even told GQ that he wrote a letter apologizing to Brendan Frazier in the past about the incident that had occurred, but the letter he had written admitted absolutely no wrongdoing. Frazier said that an apology would have to be meaningful. I quote, it would have to be, I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for, sincere? He continued to say, I would want some gesture of making medicine out of poison somehow. I don't know what that is, but that would be my hope, end quote. Golden Globes aside, Frazier said he's committed to doing everything he could possibly do to advocate for the whale and will gladly pursue other award opportunities that may arise. He said, and I quote, I owe it to myself. I owe it to the filmmakers. I owe it to my kids. This is my shot, end quote. This absolutely is his shot. And Brendan Frazier is a very, very, very much beloved celebrity actor uh, just overall personality that we've seen on our big screens for years and years and years i myself grew up watching his films as did millions upon millions of individuals around the world brendan frazier is very widely respected um i respect his stance on this 100 percent stand by him on this and i commend him for being so brave in in his interviews it's just not being not backing down not ever mincing words you know you can tell that he unlike the hollywood foreign press association and their lackluster apologies uh that apparently um were provided to frazier his interview is sincere he himself is sincere in what he says and he's not he doesn't owe it to anybody to go to the golden globes you know it's i don't blame him one iota and i truly truly do respect the fact that you now he even said it my mother did not raise a hypocrite i may be many things you can call me many things but that's not one of them and kudos to him man seriously i i can't imagine what this guy has been through he's been through so so much in the hell and back but to see him back on the big screen this renaissance the renaissance continues it's just it's awesome to say rooting for this guy to succeed so so much i really hope that the remaining dreams that this guy has come true because he deserves it and then some just a kind soul and as real as it gets. I absolutely cannot wait to see The Whale on December 9th when it comes out. Absolutely cannot wait. One of my most anticipated films of the entire year. And I really can't wait to see how he performs in the role. And I'm also hoping for many award nominations 
including an Oscar nomination, which is also highly, highly rumored. God, it would just be awesome. That would be so awesome. Brendan Fraser getting nominated for an Oscar for his role. I mean, just the ultimate, the ultimate comeback. And so deserving. So deserving. I'm honestly at a loss of words with it because it's just remarkable. It's remarkable how strong he has stayed. Yeah, we're all rooting for him. The renaissance continues and we're here for it. <laughs> we are here for it on the B Muse Reviews podcast. If there's any more news that comes out about the film or Brendan Fraser, we'll definitely be sure to talk about it here on the podcast. All right, and our next topic today. Nicolas Cage is currently in talks for National Treasure 3. Yes, you heard that correctly. All right, and this news comes to us from CBR. As reported by The Hollywood Reporter, Cage is in various stages of discussions for sequels to both National Treasure and Face Off. However, it is unclear if the project referenced is a third National Treasure film or Ben Gates' potential return in the upcoming Disney Plus series National Treasure Edge of History. Now, Nicolas Cage made his way back into the spotlight recently with the success of the film Pig and the unbearable weight of massive talent, but many fans of the actor have been pushing to see him steal the Declaration of Independence once again. While Disney has been allegedly developing National Treasure 3 since around 2007, there has been little to no information revealed until the talks of Cage returning for a sequel. John Turtletab, the director behind the first two films, was certain that Disney did not quite realize how much the internet is begging for a third national treasure. Additionally, Tom Gormican, director of The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent, even pitched an idea of a national treasure crossover in the hypothetical film Nicolas Cage would travel with co-star John Voight on a series of adventures led by a map, and they take the treasure map and find themselves basically in a national treasure-like situation where Cage has to channel his character from national treasure in order to get himself out and save his family. I mean, first of all, that film is a film I would watch 10 times over. If it's not National Treasure 3, give us the National Treasure John, <laughs> the the actual like biopic <laughs> version of National Treasure. I'd be all here for it. But Jerry Bruckheimer, producer of the National Treasure films, also teased the possibility of a third feature length installment in the franchise. He said, and I quote, we're certainly working on one for streaming and we're working on one for the big screen. He continues saying, hopefully they'll both come together, end quote. As for Edge of History, announced cast members include Lisette Oliveira, Lyndon Smith, and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Harvey Keitel and Justin Barra will also reprise their respective roles of Special Agent Peter Sadusky and Riley Poole. Announced in May 2020, National Treasure Edge of History features a much younger cast with a much similar story. However, fans noticed that Cage's name was missing from the cast list, and writers and producers of National Treasure, Cormac and Marianne Wiverly, were confident that could change. They said, and I quote, We'll have him in two seconds. He's our absolute favorite actor out of everyone. We pitched him as Ben Gates before he even was Ben Gates. He was our first choice. End quote. Now, Disney Plus's National Treasure Edge of History premieres with its very first two episodes on December 14th, 2022. Wow. Well, this is this is exciting. This really is exciting. I'm absolutely one of those people that have been clamoring and wishing for a National Treasure 3. It's an awesome franchise. Nicolas Cage is one of my favorite actors. He's an incredible talent. And overall, too, these films include, they're based around my favorite period of American history, the revolutionary times and honestly i really want to see more of it i really want to see more of his character i want to see where the story could go uh, what's the next adventure he and his family are led on and how it ties to his specific um, family's past um, how he w ultimately what ben gates's goal is uh, for preserving united states history learning more uncovering more secrets like it's it's fascinating to me. I absolutely love the first two National Treasure films. No, the first one, the second one, Book of Secrets. They're both really awesome films. I, I'm a big fan of both of them. 
And a National Treasure 3 is definitely something I'm going to continue rooting for. And based on the producers and the directors, everyone involved, it's looking like this thing's going to happen. With enough fan interest, and it's, oh, believe me, it's there, and it's been there for quite a while. I, I think this is actually going to come to fruition. That's my hope, at least. We'll have to wait and see. Any more news that does come out about this, we'll definitely be sure to talk about it here on the podcast. But in the meantime, let us know your thoughts on this news. Nicholas Cage in talks for National Treasure 3. Be sure to write to us and let us know. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, in our next topic today, this comes to us from IndieWire. Jeff Goldblum officially joins the Wicked feature film. Jeff Goldblum is off to be the wizard, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. The actor is in talks to join the cast for the upcoming Wicked films as Variety first reported. A source close to the project tells IndieWire that Goldblum still is in early talks. However, if Goldblum is confirmed, he will play the wizard depicted in the original Stephen Schwartz stage musical as the beloved but mysterious ruler of the Land of Oz, capable of incredible feats of magic and power. Joel Grey originated the part in the Broadway production based on Gregory Maguire's 1995 novel, Wicked, The Life and Times of the Wicked Witch of the West. Now, of course, the character of the wizard originates in L. Frank Baum's classic 1900 children's novel, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and has been portrayed on screen numerous times, most notably by Frank Morgan in the 1939 MGM film adaptation of Baum's original work. Now, Universal Pictures' Wicked is a prequel to The Wizard of Oz, telling the origin stories of the Wicked Witch of the West and the benevolent Glinda the Good Witch. The Wicked films star Cynthia Erivo, who will one day become the Wicked Witch, as well as Ariana Grande as Glinda. In addition, Bridgerton star Jonathan Bailey has also been cast as Fierro, a carefree man who ends up in a love triangle with the two female leads. In the Heights and Crazy Rich Asians director, John M. Chu helms the two-part big screen adaptation, which adapts each act of the musical into a separate movie. Universal Pictures will release both films on Christmas, with part one coming in 2024 and part two coming in 2025. In his statement announcing the decision to split the musical into two films, Chu attributed it to a desire to avoid cutting songs or characters while further fleshing out the story in its world. He said, and I quote, with more space, we can tell the story of Wicked as it's meant to be told while bringing in more depth and surprise to the journeys for these beloved characters, end quote. Well, this is really exciting. Absolutely really exciting. I've never seen Wicked. Uh, I've never seen the play. I don't really know much about it other than it tells the basically the origin of the Wicked Witch of the West and how she came to be, basically. But having Jeff Goldblum in this as the Wizard of Oz, you got to be kidding me. I mean, that's, that's, that's perfect casting. I mean, Jeff Goldblum... Uh, even though he's become, uh, you know, just a an overall meme of positivity, it's 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 the greatest thing ever. Honestly, Jeff Goldblum is one of my favorite actors. <laughs> he's just oh my gosh, uh, just anything the dude does is gold. No pun intended. He's gonna kill it in this role. I I know he's in early talks, but I don't see how he. D- Knowing he, you know, he's very musically inclined too. He's got a whole jazz ensemble and quartet. He, I think, recently just recorded an album. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, he has like a residency in Las Vegas, where he's played a couple of shows there, um, in, in support of his music. And the guy is incredibly talented. To know that he's even remotely anywhere near involved, uh, in this film and will likely portray the Wizard of Oz in this two-part adaptation. That is an absolute home run in my book. Very curious to know what your thoughts are. What do you think about Jeff Goldblum joining the Wicked feature film? Do you think he's going to kill it in the role? Do 
you think he won't do well and he doesn't fit in the movie. What are your thoughts about Wicked itself and uh, the fact that it's, it's going to be made into two separate feature films? That way it tells the first part of the story as well as the second part of the story cohesively. What are your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and let us know. And as always, comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, in our next topic today, HBO's Westworld has been canceled after four seasons. This comes to us from CNN. HBO is pulling the plug on its futuristic drama Westworld. In a statement praising creators Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, HBO lauded the show for taking viewers on a mind-bending odyssey, raising the bar at every step. They said, and I quote, We are tremendously grateful to Nolan and Joy, along with their immensely talented cast, producers, and crew, and all of our partners at Kittler Films, Bad Robot, and Warner Brothers Television. It's been a thrill to join them on this journey. End quote. Westworld ends after a four-season run, the most recent of which came to a close in August. During its run, the drama notched 54 Emmy nominations and won nine, according to HBO. The creators had previously expressed a desire for a fifth season to wrap up current storylines. The show starred Evan Rachel Wood, Thandoe Newton, Ed Harris, Jeffrey Wright, and Tessa Thompson, among others. Well, this is a shame to hear. I mean, the fact that it had a four-season run, though, you know, can't really uh, be too sour about that. It had a four-season run. You know, many shows struggled to even get renewed to begin with after its first season. I myself did see the first season of Westworld. I wanted to see more of it, and honestly, just never got around to it. Um, it was a great, awesome first season. Exactly what the joint statement said, you know, the mind-bending odyssey where they raise the bar at every step. Every episode was just like crazier and crazier in, in a good way, obviously, but never seen a show like this. It, it was a very interesting concept. Very interesting concept. Yeah, it's, no, it's a shame to hear any time that a show gets canceled, but the fact that they had even had a four-season run, though, kudos to them and kudos to everyone involved. What are your thoughts on Westworld, though? Are you a fan of the show Westworld? Have you ever seen it? If you did, what are your thoughts on it? I myself never got past the first season. Do you think I'm missing out? If so, let me know. Be sure to write to us. Let us know your thoughts and comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, in our next topic today, Joseph Quinn and Lupita Nyong'o have officially been cast in A Quiet Place Day One. This news comes to us from MSN. Joseph Quinn might soon go from shredding Metallica classics in order to distract hostile aliens to being very, 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 very quiet in an attempt not to draw the attention of hostile aliens. Deadline is reporting that Quinn is in talks to join Paramount's A Quiet Place spinoff day one. If he signs on the project, British actor Quinn would join Lupita Nyong'o in a film that, from its title at least, definitely sounds like it'll work as a prequel of sorts to the John Krasinski created franchise. Although Quinn has worked regularly over the last decade or so, mostly in British productions, his career absolutely exploded over the last year as he took the role of Eddie Munson in the most recent season of Stranger Things, a hard-rocking nerd who became one of the show's breakout characters. Day One is expected to hit theaters in 2024, while A Quiet Place Part 3 is scheduled for 2025. This is exciting news awesome to see that these two will be on screen together in the same film i still have to see quiet place 2 i've not seen part 2 it's something that it's a film that's been on my list for quite a while now and it's one that i'm definitely going to be sure to, to check out prior to these films coming out awesome to know that this is in the production and really happy for both of them i think what john krasinski created in a quiet place is very interesting and this and to know that this is Turned into a, a whole franchise now. It's getting a third installment in 2025, and it's even getting a prequel spinoff in day one coming out in 2024. Really awesome. Really awesome to hear, and, and very deserving. The first Quiet Place was very different, but really enjoyed it, and looking forward to checking out the second one too. But with all that being said, are you a fan of the Quiet Place franchise? Did you see it exploding into what it is now? 
Um, are you excited for the third installment as well as this prequel spinoff? If so, let us know your thoughts. Be sure to write to us and comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, our next topic today. A new Princess Diaries film is currently in development. This comes to us from the Orlando Sentinel. Disney is returning to Genovia for a third Princess Diaries movie. It is not clear whether Anne Hathaway will reprise her role as down-to-earth royal Mia Thermopolis in a new installment, which is currently being written. However, Hathaway recently expressed interest in returning with her on-screen grandmother Julie Andrews to play the posh queen Clarice Rinaldi to the franchise that turned her into a star. She said, and I quote, I would more than entertain it. I'm pulling for it, Hathaway told Entertainment Tonight. She continued saying, if there's any way to get Julie Andrews involved, I think we would make it work, end quote. Andrews' involvement in The Princess Diaries 3 is similarly ambiguous. Plot details haven't been confirmed, but the threequel is expected to continue the story of The Princess Diaries franchise and the sequel royal engagement rather than rebooting this series entirely. Given the enduring popularity of The Princess Diaries, rumors have been circulating for a third installment for quite some time, but this is so far the biggest attempt by Disney yet to transport audiences back to the royal world of Genovia as Mia Thermopolis would say, quote, miracles happen once in a while when you believe, end quote. Well, this is exciting news to hear for sure. Many fans of the Princess Diary films, I have seen parts of the films in the past. I know the general concept. Um, I know she was sort of like a, a, like a nerdy student and um, had one, like one close friend and uh, was bullied a lot in school. And, and she, you know, she, didn't have like a, she didn't have a lot going on for her in terms of social life or and anything of that nature, I think in high school at the time, so in the movie, so I think no, from nerdy girl uh, in school to royalty of Genovia, I myself didn't grow up watching these films. However, I know that millions and millions of individuals did, and I at least know of this franchise, and to know that it's a possibility to see a third one, why not? If there's gonna be a third National Treasure film, there, there might as well be a third Princess Diaries film, you know, even though I'm a fan of one franchise over the other, I respect both franchises entirely. And I would much rather see a sequel that makes sense opposed to, you know, them just re simply rebooting it uh, when they could continue the story, as Anne Hathaway mentions. So, you know, that's really exciting to hear that this is currently in development and very curious to know what you all think. Um, are you a fan of the Princess Diaries franchise? Are you excited for a third film? Have you been clamoring for it? Uh, like I've been clamoring for the third installment to the National Treasure franchise. Definitely curious to know what you all think. Write to us, comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, our next topic today, Constantine 2 will officially be rated R, says the director. This comes to us from CVR. The upcoming Keanu Reeves Constantine sequel will not be held back by any rating restrictions. That's for sure. Speaking to The Wrap, director Francis Lawrence confirmed that he wants Constantine 2 to finally be rated R. Rather than the PG-13 rating he was saddled with for the original 2005 film, he said, and I quote, One of the biggest things for me about the first one was we followed, per Warner Brothers, the rules to make the, a PG-13 movie in terms of violence, blood, language, sexuality. He continued saying, but the ratings board gave us a hard R based on their gray zone of intensity. And my big, big regret was that we have an R-rated film that's really a PG-13 movie. And if I was going to have to go have an R, I would have rather made an R-rated movie. I would have made it much scarier and much more violent, and I would have made it an R-rated movie." End quote. News of the Keanu Reeves-led Constantine adaptation, which doubled as Lawrence's directorial debut, receiving a sequel, which was confirmed in September, with Akiva Goldsman serving as screenwriter. In terms of tone, Lawrence assured fans that he wants to, quote, really go at it and make a real rated R Constantine, which is, I think, what people always wanted originally, not the PG-13 version that just happens to get an R. End quote. He also spoke about adding comedic elements 
to the script in line with John Constantine's trademark, quote, sarcastic, cynical sense of humor, end quote. There is currently no release date for Constantine 2 that has been announced yet. Well, you know, this is awesome news. I got to say, this is awesome news. I am an I'm a huge fan of the first Constantine film. I think it's an awesome film. Huge fan of Keanu Reeves as well. Anything to do does. Big fan of. Big fan of the Constantine movie, the Matrix franchise, John Wick franchise. I mean, don't even get me started. I mean, that's the amount of greatness contained in those films cannot be understated. But Constantine 2, when this sequel was announced, Oh, I gotta tell you, I was hyped. And we talked about it a few episodes ago in the podcast. You know, the fact that it was announced came as a pretty big shock to myself. Never thought that this film would um, get a sequel. I mean, if it did, I thought it would have happened long ago. Almost like, you know, the, with The Incredibles and um, Avatar. And it's just like, you know, these films, you ex- if they're going to have a sequel, you expect them to come, you know, two, three years, maybe, maybe four years later. But, you know, not close to 15 years. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Exciting to hear, though. Really exciting to hear this news. Cannot wait. Constantine, I I was always curious. And it makes sense hearing what Francis Lawrence has said in in his interview. Saying how they're basically hand-tied and were forced to play by the rules to do whatever thing they could to make a PG-13 movie. They did all of that, and they still ended up with a rated R version of the film. And with that being said, if he was going to have it be rated R anyway, he would have much rather pushed the envelope and make it an R. Because if you're in that realm anyway, you might as well go all out. And I agree with that. And it could have been so much more, I'm sure, but... The story itself and the elements they included in the film were really cool, and I think that's what makes it stand the test of time. This film has developed quite a big cult following over the last 15 plus years uh, since it originally came out. I believe in 2005, I'm going to say, this film came out. It's quite a bit of time in between uh, films, but I'm curious to see what goes on. I, I, th- I think it's awesome that Keanu Reeves is returning as John Constantine, it's such an awesome role for him. I mean, he was great in the first film, and I'm really, really looking forward to see where um, his character is. You know, 17 years later after the first film, what what's all going on? What what's where's John Constantine and his mission to buy his way back into in, into good graces with the light? Oh, it's gonna be twisted. It's going to be twisted. The first movie is twisted. Tilda Swinton being in it was awesome. You know, Shia LaBeouf's character in the film was was really awesome, too. It was really cool. It was a really funny character. Great comedic timing. Great levity in the film. This has got me wanting to go back and rewatch uh, the original Constantine. But awesome film and one that you should definitely check out. Curious to know what your thoughts are on Constantine 2 currently in development. And the fact that it will definitely definitely be rated r i mean come on you know we're in for the juice we were gonna get ready for the truckload of juice tropicana this film is gonna kick so much ass and it's gonna be awesome can't wait when there is an official release date and any more news surrounding this film you can bet that we will be talking about it here on the podcast in the meantime be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts and comment below if you are watching on youtube all right our next topic today Sandman series has been renewed for a season two. This comes to us from What's on Netflix. The 10 episode season, which arrived on August 5th, covers the first two volumes of Neil Gaiman's seminal comics, Preludes and Nocturnes, as well as The Doll's House. Following the first season's release, we saw a bonus episode drop on August 19th, 2022. Now, what we see in the first season of The Sandman merely scratches the surface the sandman comic spans 10 core volumes plus a prequel and many spin-offs in a wider sandman universe if netflix wants to complete the saga there's potential for many more seasons well i am for one am hugely excited to hear this news so deserving of a season two i'm still working my way through season one 
I just had, I've had so much stuff I've been watching that so sometimes it just takes me a lot longer to finish shows uh, than I would like. I don't see it as dedicated to finishing them as I should. I, a lot of times I branch off and start other shows and I'm attending all these premieres of movies and, and, and obviously working on the podcast and um, you know so it's a lot to keep up with sometimes but I am almost finished the series. It's incredible. I love this series. It's incredibly dark, but very unique in the story elements, how it ties to, you know, DC Comics as well. It's really interesting. It's a really interesting show. If you have not checked it out yet, be sure to do so. It's incredibly unique, creative. The visuals are stunning. Um, I, I, I just think this show is very interesting, pushes a lot of boundaries, and is incredibly well adapted. I know Neil Gaiman is a huge supporter of the series, and and I'm truly happy to see that his creation has come to life in such a remarkable way. Netflix has killed it with this series, and they will continue to do so uh, with the upcoming season two, and I hope I truly hope that we can continue to get more and more of this show. Absolutely deserving of it. Cannot wait to finish the first season. We'll be sure to review it here on the podcast when I uh, do finish it up. But for now, knowing that season two is on the way, it gives me that extra motivation I need to finish the last couple episodes. Can't wait to see what season two will bring. In the meantime, though, be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. Are you a fan of the Sandman series? Have you seen it yet so far? If you have, let us know your thoughts. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, our next topic today, Dodgeball 2 is officially ready to go. They just need a yes from Ben Stiller. That's all that is needed. This comes to us from Variety. It has been 18 years since Dodgeball, a true underdog story, opened in theaters, and the film remains a bona fide classic for generations of moviegoers who were teenagers in the early 2000s. Directed by Ross and Marshall Thurber, the sports comedy stars Vince Vaughn and a deranged Ben Stiller as rival gym owners who face off in a dodgeball tournament. The supporting cast includes Christine Taylor, Justin Long, Rip Torn, Stephen Root, and Alan Tudyk. According to Long, a dodgeball sequel idea has been ironed out by Vaughn and is just waiting on Stiller's approval. He said, and I quote, Of course I would love to do it. And I hope it ends up happening. But I think Ben Stiller is a little... What he told me on that podcast was that he's a little trepidatious about doing a sequel to something so beloved. And something that people enjoy so much. End quote. Now Long continued saying, I quote, It's very risky. You don't want to shit on the original. You want something just as good. So I think that he's a little wary of that, of trying to recreate something that was very specific to that time. But I hope he comes around on it. End quote. Long continued to say, quote, Vince is a very convincing person. So I'm just hoping Vince can convince him of of his idea. It's a very, it's a funny idea. I don't want to say what it is. I know Ben loves dodgeball and loves that character. I remember how much fun he had playing it. He was always laughing. End quote. The dodgeball cast re- the dodgeball cast reunited in 2017 for a charity event, and Long said he saw a spark in Stiller that hints he could come around to wanting to do a second film. He said, and I quote, When we got together years later to do a mini reunion for this charity and Ben put on the mustache again, I remember him talking about how happy it made him playing White Goodman again and how much fun that character was. I do know that Vince has a great idea for it and it's just a matter of getting Ben on board. End quote. Man, this is such awesome news. I hope and pray that a Dodgeball 2 comes to the big screen someday. I really hope that it does. You know, Ben Stiller has obviously... I'm sure he's apprehensive about taking on Dodgeball 2 because of what happened with Zoolander 2. Zoolander originally came out in like 2001 and there's about like a 15 year gap between the first one and the second one. And I remember the second one just absolutely bombed. I think it made like 
Let me see here. Uh, according to worldwide, it made fifty-six million dollars worldwide, and barely made back its budget of over fifty million dollars. So yeah, it's safe to say that they made absolutely no money on this film. Um, the movie was also eviscerated by critics. Um, I myself was not a fan. I laughed maybe a couple times. Like it, it was just a very mind-numbing film. Um, and I can see why. He, I can see why Ben Stiller is very uh, trepidatious, as Justin Long pointed out. I can see why. And at the end of the day, you, it's it's tough to it's tough to you know recapture that magic that you had in the bottle. But with so many talented people involved, as long as the story is right, as long as it all makes sense and Apparently it's a really great idea. That's what it takes. And as long as the execute as Ben Stiller is the man to execute it, trust me. It's the guy is a phenomenal director. I mean what what he's done with Severance. I mean if you haven't seen Severance, I don't know what you're doing. Go watch it immediately. But I mean the dude is incredibly talented. He's directed one of my favorite comedies of all time. Still criminally underrated film that nobody really talks about. The Cable Guy, I, I just the movie is a dark comedy at its best. Overall, I, I'm really hoping to see this film, Dodgeball Two. It's ready to go. They just need a yes from Ben Stiller, and they include here in the article that Stiller did admit to Esquire earlier in the year that watching Zoolander Two bomb around the world was quote not a great experience end quote. So, yeah, I mean, the guy is definitely hesitant to say yes to something that could, you know, not turn out well. Um, and, you know, that, that's the whole part about taking chances, right? You know, you, you just don't know. You win some, you lose some. But I don't see how this could be a loss. Zoolander 2, I mean, the first Zoolander really didn't make much money anyway. It was a, it was a cult film because of the, the, the fans that kind of just gravitated towards the film after it already bombed in theaters. Nobody went to go see it when it originally came out, but it's still to this day known as one of the funniest comedies of all time. Zoolander is absolutely a top five comedy for me, hands down. That movie has endless quotes, endless quotes. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And you can go on and on and on. Will Ferrell is one of the greatest comedic villains of all time, playing Jacobi Mugatu. I mean, if you have never seen the original Zoolander, please do yourself a favor and watch it. It is incredibly funny, and just an on. <laughs> it's it's so different, so unique. And, but and that was the thing, you know. It's tough to recreate that with dodgeball. With the dodgeball. You know, it actually takes place in the real world where there's actual, <laughs> it's actual reality going on. It's not like, it's not where like we're in this like, pretend model world where like it's everything's about like fashion and modeling and it's like the biggest thing in, in the world and there's like this underground modeling. Like it's like this whole world of like, <laughs> you know, of uh, m you know, Malaysia. <laughs> like dodgeball is much more of a grounded comedy. Even though, obviously, the whole Las Vegas tournament and all that stuff, like, it's much more realistic than the universe that Zoolander takes place in. And for that reason alone, I think that the story idea that Vince Vaughn has, he has it ironed out, apparently, according to Justin Long. I think that it would really work. I do. And I'm hoping that it happens. Really hoping to see everyone involved. I... I to see Justin Long, Christine Taylor, Stephen Rue, Alan Tudyk, to see these people that would come back for the roles, I mean, I, I would really, really love to see it. And I'm hoping it does happen. But we'll have to wait and see. At this point, the movie's ready to go. The idea is done. They just need a yes from Ben Stiller. And it's a green light. So we'll wait to see what happens. Any more news that comes out about this, we'll be sure to talk about it here on the podcast. But in the meantime, what are your thoughts? Have you ever seen Dodgeball? Have you ever seen Zoolander? Make sure you see both of you. You've never seen them. 
Are you excited for the possibility of there being a dodgeball too? Are you hoping it happens? Be sure to write to us and let us know and comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, in our next topic today, Apple TV Plus is officially raising its prices. This comes to us from IGN. Apple is raising the cost of its subscription services across the board and the change includes increasing Apple TV Plus, Apple Music, and its Apple One bundle. Apple says it's raising its prices to account for the music industry's quote, increase in licensing costs, end quote, and explains that its Apple TV Plus hike is in order after a quote, very low price launch. The publisher has grown its TV and movie offering since its 2019 debut at $4.99, remaining one of the cheapest streaming services until now. Apple's sweeping price bumps take effect today and include Apple TV Plus $6.99 a month, previously a price of $4.99. Well, what are you going to do? Supply and demand? It's only a matter of time before these streaming services do this. All They're all doing it. Disney Plus was one of the first to raise its prices. Uh, obviously, Netflix introducing a new ad tier, so they have more alternative options. Um, they were obviously always the most expensive. I believe that HBO Max is still $4.99, uh, which is an incredible deal. And Disney Plus specifically raised its prices to, I think, about $7.99. So Apple TV Plus raising its prices not a big deal i mean it is what it is if you want to watch the shows you're gonna to have to pay the price and at the end of the day 6.99 is less than a burrito at chipotle so honestly it's not that big of a deal to me um i will take it but now if you know if they try doubling the price or something that's a, that's a whole nother that's a whole nother thing and ultimately it's not a cable bill the cable bills i mean you're still paying a cable bill now. I don't even understand why close to $200 a month for channels that most people don't even watch. And for $6.99 just on Apple TV Plus, I mean, you have a plethora of content. Adding that to Discovery Plus, Paramount Plus, um, Disney Plus, HBO Max. Netflix, Hulu, I mean, you name it. There's so much content out there. Movies and shows galore. So, if you're paying a cable bill, don't waste your money. <laughs> don't waste your money, honestly. They have YouTube TV out there now, too. There's so many options for streaming services that it's just, it's incredible. It's the, it just continues to grow and grow and grow. But that's the world we live in now. The streaming the streaming platforms will continue to grow. And I think they will eventually overtake cable for sure. It's just a matter of time. But regarding this price hike in Apple TV+, Plus, curious to know what your thoughts are. Be sure to write to us and let us know. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. And speaking of streaming services and its changes, Netflix adds a cheaper ad tier However, it includes quite a few restrictions. Now, this comes to us from No Techie. Many shows are not available on Netflix's ad-supported tier, and these shows include The Crown, Cobra Kai, Arrested Development, Breaking Bad, The Good Place, Grey's Anatomy, House of Cards, How to Get Away with Murder, New Girl, and Peaky Blinders. All these shows are currently unavailable on Netflix's cheaper ad tier. Well, that's one way to get you to double your money and uh, up upgrade that membership. Do I agree with this move? Not necessarily. Because I think if you're choosing to save some money and just simply choosing the ad tier uh, version of the app, I do believe that you should still have full access to everything, especially if you're going to be uh, you know, watching ads on the platform. I don't see why they would restrict certain content. I really don't, especially because if anyone is going to be signed up for the ad tier, you know, if, if you weren't signed up for Netflix already, the one thing that's going to get you to sign up are these shows. But if they're not available, then no one's going to really sign up as much as I would think. That's just my thought process going into it. That would be my mindset going into it. If I didn't have Netflix currently, I would go. I would look at it and go, okay, well, I can finally watch those shows I've been hearing about, P P 
Peaky Blinders, Cobra Kai, uh, The Crown, you name it. I, I'll check into those now, but but knowing that they're not included in the uh, ad tier version, it kind of just defeats the whole purpose. So I don't know. It's kind of upsetting to hear, but it's Netflix, so I'm not really shocked. Not really shocked. Uh, they, I feel like they, they've made so many mistakes, but you live and you learn. And I do think that all their streaming services are learning from them specifically. So curious, very, very curious. But with that said, uh, what are your thoughts on this Netflix cheaper ad tier and its restrictions that are included with the ad tier? What are your thoughts on it? Do you agree with this? Do you not agree with it? Be sure to write to us, let us know, and as always, comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, and our next topic today, switching gears to some gaming news. It's official. EA Sports College Football is making its return in the summer of 2024. I am beyond hype for this news. Beyond hype. I have been wanting college football to make its return in a video game and it hasn't happened it's been years and years and years i think 2014 was the last year that they had it obviously with the licensing and all that going into uh, the games and the controversy that that all stirred up ea sports could no longer make the college football games however in the summer of 2024 it's making its return incredible news going to sell so many copies and i cannot wait to get my hands on one by 2024 highly doubt that i highly doubt that it'll come out for anything other than the new gen consoles i will have to find some way to play this game for sure but but we will leave that in 2024 for us to figure out <laughs> in the meantime going to just celebrate this news extremely extremely happy to know that college football is officially coming back in a video game form can't wait i have my copy of ncaa football 2013 and and we will definitely be featuring some of that gameplay on our youtube channel for sure but in the meantime very curious to know what your thoughts are have you ever played the ncaa football games are you a fan of the franchise? Are you excited to hear that these games are coming back? Be sure to write to us. Let us know. And if you are watching on YouTube currently, be sure to comment below and let us know your thoughts on this news. Super exciting. All right, and switching gears once again, to this time to some music news. The recent Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremony took place in Los Angeles on Saturday, November 5th. The 2022 class in included... Dolly Parton, Eminem, Pat Benatar and Neil Gerardo, Duran Duran, Eurythmics, Lionel Richie, and Carly Simon. Judas Priest and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis also joined the Rock Hall with the Award for Musical Excellence. And from the induction ceremony, here are some highlights. Dolly Parton live debuted new music. Eminem absolutely ripped right through a hits-filled medley. Duran Duran was arguably met with the evening's loudest cheers, even though they dealt with technical difficulties during their set. The band even joked that, well, we just had to prove to you that we weren't actually lip syncing this entire time. <laughs> but uh, but the band actually ended on an uh, unexpectedly sad note in this speech where Simon Le Bon began reading a letter from former member Andy Taylor in which he explained his absence and revealed that he currently has stage four prostate cancer. He said, and I quote, I am truly sorry and massively disappointed. I couldn't make it. Let there be no doubt. I was stoked about the whole thing. Even bought a new guitar with the essential whammy, the letter read. He continued saying, and I quote, I often doubted the day would come. I'm sure as hell glad I'm around to see the day, end quote. More highlights from the ceremony include that Judas Priest brought the pyro during their set, and Pat Benatar and Neil Gerardo proved that love can be long-lasting. The Eurythmics shimmered in matching sparkling suits. Terry Lewis shared more than he ever has before on stage. And overall, the ceremony was just incredible. 
the performances were incredible, and overall it came out to be a rather special night. If you want to check out any of the speeches or performances and the entire ceremony in, in its entirety, be sure to check it out now on HBO Max. You can watch the entire ceremony, catch all the speeches, catch all the performances. It's definitely not one to miss out on. Overall, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are. Have you already watched the ceremony? What did you think of it if you did? And what are your thoughts on this year's Hall of Fame induction ensemble? Is there any artist or band that you believe that should have been included this year that wasn't? Out of the artists and bands that were inducted this year, who are some of your favorites? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts and comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Hey guys, just want to take a minute to give a major shout out and say thank you to the sponsor of this week's episode of the BMU's Reviews podcast, Marla Jean Boutique. If you are seeking a gift either for yourself or a loved one who finds value in handmade items, then look no further than Marla Jean Boutique. She has a collection of trendy handmade items including clothing, wine bags, jewelry, and much, much more. Use the promo code BMUSEREVIEWS10 at checkout to receive 10% off your entire purchase. Connect with Marla Jean Boutique on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Marla Jean Boutique. And be sure to visit their website at www.marlajeanboutique.com. And once again, be sure to use the promo code BMUSEREVIEWS10 at checkout to receive 10% off your entire purchase. And now, back to the podcast. Alrighty, and our next topic today, switching back to some movie news. As always, we've seen an entirely new batch of trailers, this time including Avatar 2, The Way of Water, The Whale, as well as John Wick 4. Now, the Avatar 2 trailer is just visually stunning and just gives us uh, even more of a glimpse of what we're in for uh, with the upcoming highly anticipated Avatar 2, the sequel to the original film. With The Whale, it's our very first look. It's more of a teaser trailer, I would say, than anything. Not necessarily in a first official trailer. It's not a full-length trailer or anything like that. It's simply just, I think, like a minute long uh, at most. But it's all you need. I don't need to see any more from this film. I'm just going to go straight into seeing it December 9th when it premieres. I don't need to see anything else from this film. I don't need to know anything else besides the basic synopsis of what the film entails. Going in completely blind to it, Brendan Fraser is going to kill it in this role, and I absolutely cannot wait to see it. And lastly, John Wick 4. Dude, this trailer kicked ass. This is nuts. This film is going to be bonkers. John Wick is continuously on the run and having to basically make his way through all of the assassins of the underworld uh, of the underworld through all, across the globe. Uh, looks like Bill Skarsgård might be the main villain in this film too. We have Donnie Yen in the movie too. I mean, dude, the cast in this film looks nuts. Lawrence Fishburne's back. Dude, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I think if this film comes out in March, psh, say no more say no more cannot wait to see this film it's going to be awesome I'm hoping we get at least one more john wick film i know that they were set to film four and five back to back but the pandemic kind of ruined those plans so we're gonna get four first and uh hopefully we do get a five somewhere down the road we shall see in the meantime curious to know what your thoughts are have you seen these trailers for these new films? Out of these three new trailers, which one was your favorite and which one are you most looking forward to seeing in theaters when it does arrive? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. And as always, comment below if you're watching on YouTube. All right, and our next topic today, switching to some series reviews. First series review, recently finished the first season of Peacemaker. Knowing that the second season is on its way, it's currently in development with James Gunn. This show picks up right after the events of The Suicide Squad, the film from 2021, and Peacemaker returns home after recovering from his encounter with Bloodsport, only to discover that his freedom comes with a price. This whole series was hysterical. It was very violent, but very funny. I had a great time with this, this, with this series. Very much hard R, but... James Gunn was incredibly creative and he did not pull any punches. Knowing that he's the head of DC moving forward, 
gives me so much hope. <laughs> gives me so much hope. This series was fantastic, and Warner Brothers could not have picked anyone better to lead the charge of DC moving forward. That's 100% fact. Super excited to see where DC goes from here and how Peacemaker fits into those plans. Season two is currently in development. If you have not already, be sure to check out the first season of Peacemaker, now on HBO Max. If you have seen it, what are your thoughts? Be sure to write to us and comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Now for our next series review, recently finished the very first season of Mythic Quest, currently making my way through the second season, on the way to the third season, which I know recently just came out a couple weeks ago. The owner of a successful video game design company and his troubled staff struggle to keep their hit game, Mythic Quest, on top. That's all you need to know about this show. It is absolutely friggin' hysterical. So much dark, dry humor, which I appreciate. <laughs> I just, I, that's some of my favorite humor in a show, and this has loads of it. It is incredibly funny. Rob McElhenney is just, he's just awesome. He's great, Griff. Oh man, this show is so funny. Between Severance and Mythic Quest, those two shows alone are worth the price paying for Apple TV. I don't care about no price hike or anything. Hike it up, I don't care. I am watching these shows. I'm going to continue watching these shows. They're hysterical. This, this show is so funny, and I absolutely just love it. Can't wait to finish the second season, and I cannot wait to start the third season. If you haven't already, be sure to check it out. If you have seen it, what are your thoughts on Mythic Quest? Be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. Comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Alright, in our next topic today, getting to some film reviews. The first film we're going to review today, Ticket to Paradise. Recently got a chance to see this film. This film follows a divorced couple who teams up and travels to Bali to stop their daughter from making the same mistake that they made 25 years ago. Now, I'll say this, although the theatrical trailer, if you watch it, it pretty much just sums up the entire movie in about 2 minutes and 30 seconds or whatever the trailer hour the long the trailer is. I hate when I, I really do hate when trailers do that and they just show the entire movie. It's like if it's not a good movie or if it, even if it's a decent movie, like I'll go see it for myself. Like I don't need to see it in a trailer that just tells me the whole plot point. Anyway, I still found this film to be fun, uh, enjoyable, and it's it is a true return. I would say the biggest compliment I can give to this film is that. It is a true return to the form of beloved romantic comedies that were released in the mid-2000s era. Tons of rom-coms released in the early to mid-2000s. And of those films, this has that sort of vibe. Not a bad film at all. It's just, you know, it's not, not, a, not a great film, but not, not terrible. It's, you know, it's okay. It's a good film. Um... Like I said, the, the trailer basically just shows you the whole movie. So you, if you saw the trailer, you kind of already saw the movie. But hey, if you're in a mood for a good rom-com and you're a big fan of Julia Roberts and or George Clooney, can't go wrong with this film. But curious to know what your thoughts are. Have you seen Ticket to Paradise? If you did, what were your thoughts on it? Be sure to write to us and let us know. Next film review, Black Adam. Nearly 5,000 years after he was bestowed with the almighty powers of the Egyptian gods and imprisoned just as quickly, Black Adam is freed from his earthly tomb, ready to unleash his unique form of justice on the modern world. I gotta say, this film was awesome. Absolutely loved this film. It's a refreshing, creative origin film from DC Studios that is just truly action-packed uh it's an action-packed thrill ride from beginning to end i i gotta say you should not miss your chances to experience this film on the big screen this film is absolutely made for the big screen they've also really reminded me of like 90s action films i don't know why i just think they just, their overall tone and the style the way the action sequences play out too a lot of the slow motion in the movie works really well. It's really cool. 
how it's done. It's like DC has kind of made a staple of that too. The slow motion action sequences when you can kind of like see the breakdown of the fight sequences and what's going on. It's really cool. I, I like that. And I really like this movie a lot. I, I, I didn't like it. I loved it. I loved this movie. It was a really fun time and really enjoyable. With that said, what were your thoughts on it? Did you get to see Black Adam? If you haven't already, do not miss your chance to see this film on the big screen, like I said. Next film review, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. This film features the people of Wakanda in a fight to protect their home from intervening world powers as they mourn the death of King T'Challa. While I didn't love this film, I really, really did like it a lot. I truly did. The emotional moments between characters are extremely powerful and each action sequence is very magnificent and grand in scale. Ryan Coogler, tremendous job on this film. Serving as the sequel to the beloved first installment without its main star, I mean, incredibly difficult task. But this film honors and pays tribute to Chadwick Boseman beautifully. The beginning moment of silence, just him being featured within the Marvel logo, and at the very end, the uh, the tribute to him as well. Pure class act by Marvel Studios and Disney, and and one that definitely tugs on the heartstrings for sure, no doubt about it. But overall, really solid film, and a great choice to end Phase Four. Obviously, can't wait to see what f uh, Phase Five entails with Ant Man and the Wasp Quantumania uh, kicking it off. But overall, very solid film. Really, really enjoyed it. And a, a beautifully made, a well-made movie and just a beautiful tribute to Chadwick Boseman overall, I'd say. All right, next film review. The Banshees of Inna Sharon. This film follows two lifelong friends that find themselves at an impasse when one abruptly ends their relationship with alarming consequences for both of them. Now, I recently saw this film and just absolutely loved it. This film tells a very simple tale that is just honest and emotionally charged throughout. It's truly a wonderful script and the performances in the film are fantastic by the entire cast. Don't miss your chance to see this film in theaters. It is so unique and um, very original. Very original. It's uh, not what I expected, but walking out of the theaters, I um, I really enjoyed the. I really, really did enjoy this movie a lot. It was a lot of fun, honestly, too. I had a lot of fun watching this film. This is also, I would say this is one of those films that it's like, a, it's the breath of fresh air that you really didn't expect. I remember when I originally saw this trailer, I was just like, why in the world? Like, how, like, how is this a movie? Like, and what is this about? Like, it's such a weird concept. It felt almost as if the studio was trolling us uh, as the audience. But when going to see this film, I got to tell you, it is not the case. It is not the case at all. This film is fantastic. And it's uh, very well done, and uh, you should definitely see it. And if you have seen it, be sure to write to us and let us know exactly what you thought. Really curious to know. Next film review, The Menu. Recently had a chance to see this film, which follows a young couple that travels to a remote island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some very shocking surprises. This film was absolutely bonkers. But I got to say, Ray Fiennes has got to be still like one of the greatest performing actors, I'd say, that does not have an Oscar. He's just incredible. An incredible performer. Everything that he's in, I am glued to the screen. When, he, when he's speaking on screen, I'm glued to every word. And Anya Taylor-Joy just continues to demonstrate why she just rules the world right now in acting. She's in everything, and she's great in everything. And that's probably why she is in everything, because she's great in everything. Um, so, overall, I, you know, this, this, film, this film is very dark. It's very twisted, very unique. And I had an absolute blast while watching it. Really, 
really solid film. And A24 honestly just continues to hit it out of the park with these films. This year alone has been incredible for A24 films. And it's not over yet because I know the, the Whale is an A24 film as well. So this um, this film is different. It's it stuck with me pretty much all day after watching it and still kind of has in a way. Yeah, it's very different. This is definitely one that I would recommend to anyone to go see. I re I've been recommending this to all my friends and family. Uh, definitely check this one out. Definitely check this one out. It's different. Um... But that's what, I, that's, what, that's what I like about it most. I love a different film. I love originality, creativity, and that all comes together on screen. And uh, it's executed well with the incredible story, with a great cast, and a great script. Can't go wrong. That's You're going to hook me in 10 times out of 10 with that. All right, and for our last film review today, Devotion. I actually got a chance to see this film earlier tonight upon recording this podcast. Man. I gotta tell you, I was blown away by this movie. Blown away by this movie. This film follows a pair of U.S. Navy fighter pilots as they risk their lives during the Korean War and become some of the Navy's most celebrated wingmen. Man, oh man, oh man. Where do I begin with this film? Glenn Powell, fantastic in this movie. The story is just... It's incredibly powerful. And one that deserves to be told should have been told long ago but regardless I am so glad to know that this film will exist forever and that it will shine a light on the sacrifices and the pure hell that war is and and it's just really important to not forget the bravery of individuals and the heroic measures that they took just for the simple fact of defending freedom. Now, defending freedom is no simple feat, but it was such a simple decision for these men back then in, in the Korean War to to serve and to to fight and not even think twice not even think twice and a lot of the situations that they put themselves in most people can't even fathom but they did it anyway and that's what makes a hero that's truly what makes a hero and um i was just blown away i'm still affected by this movie that is jonathan majors if he is not nominated an Oscar for his performance in this film it'll be the biggest snub of the year it'll be the biggest snub of the year what regardless of whether he wins or not if he's not at least nominated for his performance in this film it'll be an absolute travesty so deserving just incredible a very very powerful performance by Jonathan Majors in this film and thanks to him I myself, as well as millions upon millions of people around the world, learned and will always remember who Lieutenant Jesse Brown was and also is to the United States. And just the countless sacrifices by, by individuals who, who serve in the military. Unbelievable. Just truly... Words can't really express. When human beings accomplish certain feats, there's sometimes just no words to describe the impact that it'll have for generations to come. And um, yeah, I'm really honestly just glad that this, I, I'm truly glad that this film exists. I really am. If you have not already, please do not miss your chance to see this film in theaters. It just came out, so you have plenty of time. But I, I tell you, this is not one to be missed. This is not one to miss out on. If you have already seen Devotion, please be sure to write to us and let us know exactly what your thoughts are on this film. Do you agree that Jonathan Majors should absolutely be nominated for an Oscar for his performance in this film? And does this make you even more excited to see him play Kang in the upcoming Phase 5 and Phase 6 of the MCU? 
be sure to write to us and let us know your thoughts. And as always, if you're watching on YouTube, comment below. All right, now, so for our top 10 list to end this week's podcast, we're going to be counting down the top 10 films that are being released in the month of November. Now, this podcast was meant to come out a couple weeks ago, but with my surgery and all that stuff, um, kind of had to delay some things. So still going forward with this list. Since November, it's still here. It's not done yet. It still counts. So we're going to go ahead and uh, count down the top 10 list of the film releases that I am most looking forward to checking out. Starting off with number 10, Strange World. Now, I really don't know much about this film at all. Uh, they've Disney has marketed this film terribly. I mean, I knew that this film was coming out about six months ago, I would say. I first saw a poster for it. And in between that time, I think I maybe saw a trailer once in theaters. Like they just have not marketed this film at all. Nobody know nobody really knows what it is. I mean, it's out right now in theaters. I'm going to go see it. I'm probably going to go see it. Probably going to go see it in a day or two. But I mean, for for the average moviegoer, they have no idea what this is. That's because Disney didn't do anything to inform them. Of what this movie is but it's a kids movie and when there's a kids movie out it's always gonna make money there's always gonna be parents look to, looking to take their kids to see a film and and this is one for them to do that so so with that being said still looking forward to checking this film out seems interesting enough an adventure film Disney Pixar yeah I mean I, I don't really need much more than that I'll uh, I'm sure I'll enjoy this film I'm I'm more so just curious to know like what what it's about and what it entails. It seems interesting enough though. Next on our list, number nine, Bones and All. Another film I know nothing really about other than the fact that it's a coming of age story. And honestly, I really could have put this one at number ten. Um, I think I more so just put Strange World at number ten since it's a kids movie and this Bones and All with Timothy Chalamet and Mark Rylands looks like it's going to be more so my speed. However, with that said, I, I know absolutely nothing about this film because i not seen one trailer for it. I don't need to see a trailer for a film. A lot of times just knowing who's in the film um, and having a brief one-sentence synopsis is enough for me a lot of times. So looking forward to checking this film out and learning what it's about. I've heard good things about the film, nothing terrible. Honestly, just curious to know what it's about. I'll definitely be checking this film out within the next week. Number eight on the list, She Said. This film is incredibly important, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing this film. I haven't seen it yet. Probably going to check it out in a day or two. Might catch a double feature with uh, She Said and Strange World in the same day. We'll see how it all plays out, but looking forward to seeing this film. I've heard good things about it. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it on the big screen. I'm a big fan of movies that tie into real life and even though this is a very serious and dark topic it's one that is immensely important uh, especially in our society today it's good to know this film exists and even though i know i guess you know how i guess the story would end i'm curious to know how it all came to be how it all developed and basically how how it led us to where we are now. Very much curious to see how that all plays out in this film. Number seven on the list, The Son. Now this is a tie-in to the uh, movie The Father in which Anthony Hopkins had won his Oscar for. I still have not seen The Father. It is on my list to watch. Out of all the Oscar films who have come out last year, Nomadland and The Father were the only two films I believe that I have not seen. So... Of all the Oscar films, I think that Nomadland and The Father were the only two that I had not seen. So definitely have to catch up on, definitely have to catch up and watch The Father, and then I'll go ahead and watch this film. I know that Hugh Jackman said that, you know, this role really changed the way that he approaches being a father. I'm very curious to to see how this film plays out. It looks like a very good film. I saw the trailer um, a few weeks ago and immediately was hooked and that was before i even knew that it was even uh, associated with the film the father so definitely looking forward to checking out this film 
the sun. Next on our list, number six, Devotion. Obviously, you talked about this movie earlier on the podcast. Had it ranked as number six. After seeing the film, I definitely would rank it uh, higher in terms of uh, my favorability and how much I love this film. But before going into it, it comes in at number six on our list. And at number five on our list, The Menu, another film that we talked about here earlier on the podcast. Loved this film as well. I would say that I... Even though I really enjoyed this film, I would say that I, I loved Devotion so much more. Um, so I would put Devotion above this film. However, this list pertains to anticipation level for the films prior to seeing it. This list kind of encompasses my anticipation level for the films. And so number four on our list was Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Again, another film really enjoyed and look forward to seeing how Phase 5 and Phase 6 plays out for the MCU for sure based on the events of this film. Number 3 on our list, 13 Lives. This film seems incredible. I love any movie that is based on true events and a true story, and this is the epitome of that. It's an intense, intense situation. This film stars Colin Farrell, uh, Viggo Mortensen, Really looking forward to checking this film out. I've heard nothing but great things. I've heard people are blown away, and it just seems like it's going to be incredible, and I cannot wait to check it out. Number two on our list, Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. The much-anticipated sequel to a Knives Out, Glass Onion is now in theaters and on Netflix. I've not yet gotten the chance to see this film, but I'm going to definitely do so in the next few days. I've heard from many people that they even prefer this film over the original. That they didn't think that was possible. They didn't think that this film was going to be that good. A lot of where they thought it was going to be okay. A lot of a lot of varied thoughts. But the consensus on this film is that it's great. And many people, like I said, I've, that I've talked to have said that this film even surpasses the original so that makes me even more excited to check this film out and honestly i just can't wait the cast alone is just stacked i'm really i'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what this film entails uh, number one on our list the movie i'm most looking forward to checking out this november the fablemans now this film obviously is loosely based on steven spielberg's childhood and um, basically what the path that led him to fall in love with filmmaking and become the ultimate iconic auteur that we have today. Steven Spielberg is the most iconic director. Um, when, when you think of directing in Hollywood, I mean, many names obviously come to mind, but Spielberg is always within the top three. You know, obviously next to Scorsese and many others. Steven Spielberg is the creme de la creme of Hollywood royalty. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing this film in theaters. I've heard nothing but great things. Definitely going to check it out within the next day or two as well. All right. And to end this week's podcast, I just wanted to take this time to talk about um, two individuals that we recently lost. And one of those individuals being Jason David Frank. Now, on November 19th, it was announced that Jason David Frank, an actor and professional mixed martial artist who was best known for his role in the Power Rangers franchise as Tommy Oliver, the Green and White Ranger, had passed away. He also portrayed the Red Ranger in the Power Rangers Zeo franchise and also returned to the franchise as the Black Ranger in Power Rangers Dino Thunder. You know, he's a star from my childhood, and I grew up watching him. You know, taking out Ivan Ooze with the rest of the teenagers with attitude, man. I gotta tell you this this one, uh, yeah, this one really hurts. Um, Jason David Frank was forty nine years old when he passed away. He leaves behind his uh, wife and kids. He will always be remembered, and he will be missed dearly. My thoughts and prayers are with his family during this difficult time. I also just want to take this moment to say, you know, if. If you or someone you know is struggling and you feel like you can't do it on your own, you don't have to. You are never alone. 
there is always, always someone that will be there for you, that will listen to you, and that will want to help. You are more loved than you know. Always, always know that there is someone out there that will be there for you and that will listen. You are loved more than you know. J.C. David Frank passes away at the age of 49 years old. May he rest in peace. And tragically, another loss that we recently endured, uh, Kevin Conroy passing away. On November 10th, 2022, it was announced that the legendary voice actor Kevin Conroy had passed away at the age of 66. Conroy is best known for serving as the voice of Bruce Wayne and Batman in countless shows, films, and video games. He's another star from my childhood gone way too soon. My thoughts and prayers go out to Conroy's family during this time. May he rest in peace. And that just about wraps up this installment of the Be Muse Reviews podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Musica. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at Be Muse Reviews. And be sure to listen every week on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, and all other streaming platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like, leave a comment, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to receive notifications that inform you exactly when our podcast and all other videos are out. And as mentioned, be sure to visit our website, www.musicoprojects.com. There you'll find all the links to our social pages, links to our latest podcast episodes, and also be able to read our latest blog posts as well. We'll be back next Friday with a new episode of the Be Muse Reviews podcast, so stay tuned for more. And as always, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.